I've been researching my book on social media literacies and thinking about the, the opposite of the current argument about is, is using the web dumbing down culture or is, is Google making us stupid? The opposite being in, in what ways does use of the, the web and digital media and networked publics make those who, who know how to use it more intelligent? What, what uh, pioneer Doug Engelbart called raising the, the collective IQ. In, in that regard, one of the real uh, pioneers is Andy Clark, uh, who's written uh, about natural born cyborg, cyborgs and the, and the future of intelligence. So I interviewed um, Professor Clark uh, recently about his ideas and, and about uh, these notions. I'm, I'm talking with uh, Andy Clark here Whose, whose book, uh, Natural Born Cyborgs, uh, attracted my attention a, a, a few years ago and came to mind when I started thinking about writing about the, the kinds of literacies that people are going to, to need to know. And um, Andy, could you just briefly uh, introduce yourself, what, what your, your institutional affiliation is and, and, uh, and what you're doing now? Sure, yeah, I'm uh, delighted to chat. Uh, my name is Andy Clark. I'm a professor of logic and metaphysics at Edinburgh University. Um, I guess my background is mostly in philosophy of cognitive science, so the, the tag professor of logic and metaphysics doesn't, uh, doesn't, really, um, doesn't really capture it, but that's the, uh, that's the technical post. I'm in the School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences. I should give them a plug. which uh, human minds have, have always, or for a very long time, not really been enclosed by, by the physical brain, that there's a kind of interaction of culture and technology and, and the physical uh, part of our, our nervous system, and, and you write about the future of intelligence. So I, I'm thinking of quite the opposite from what the a lot of the current debate is, is, is using the web degrading culture, or is Google making us stupid, in the, in the words of Nick Carr's article. And, and I'm thinking, and that's, that's worth thinking about mm -hmm. and debating, but I think what's lost in that is the, the point of view that you, you really begin to open up that the digital technologies and, and networks properly used could increase our intelligence. So. I, I wanted to ask you what you thought in terms of teaching the, the current and, and future generations, what they need to know that would increase their chances of becoming more intelligent. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's putting, that's putting the practical spin on it. Always tough one for a philosopher, but, uh, but let's have a go. Um, so, you know, I, I think from my point of view, the the first thing is that when you get a headline that says something like, is the internet making us dumb, you realize that, um, that what the us is that they're referring to is something like just a little biological bit of, the, of what's actually a larger system. It's that little biological bit that might be in some way changing its profile. I think that's correct, although we shouldn't think that the changes are too radical, but it's probably changing it. Um, but I think that the right question to ask about ourselves is whether, as a result, we're able to um, to fulfil more of our projects, to explore ideas in ways that um, that are more fulfilling and more productive. And I, I think when we judge ourselves in that way, then we actually see that the the internet is a tool or a, a piece of scaffolding is a way that I'd rather think about it, because tool makes it seem as if it's something that that I just pick up and use, rather than something that is actually contributing to who and what I am. Um, but like all of these kinds of scaffolding, I think language is another one, um, it, it works for good and for bad for certain projects. Um, some of our projects will do better, some of them will do worse. There'll be individual differences, some of us will be do, do better and others will do worse. But one other factor that maybe we can talk about later, 
is that I think it's very early days for this technology, for this kind of scaffolding. And um, one thing we've seen in the past is how over time we scaffold our own scaffolding and thus kind of find ways of, or develop ways of using it better. Well, we've developed these, these institutions. Yeah. Um, you're, you and, and I both teach in institutions yeah. for, for providing the kind of cultural scaffolding around uh, what humans have, have learned and have used reading and, and, and writing and, and print to preserve. Um, outside of, of metaphysics, where do you see the role of, of institutions in preparing people for this kind of new scaffolding that's, that's unfolding with the web? Yeah, um, I think I think I think you're right that you know if you think about our our best bits of old scaffolding like um, like books and things like that, well, whole kinds of institutions and teaching regimes grew up to um, train us to use books better, so that the kind of human book symbiosis was even more productive than than it used to be. Um, and I think that when we we set those sorts of things up, sometimes we sort of do it with a little bit of forced thought, so we kind of try and work out what sort of scaffolding might work. But really, a lot of it seems to be trial and error, and it takes quite a while for the right sort of stuff to kind of accrue around so that, if you like, you get the most bang from the technology. Um, so I actually think that although we can do some of this kind of deliberately, you might say, you know, people have the worry about skipping around on the internet too much, and you might kind of think, okay, you know, I could, I could have a sort of device that limits my ability to do that. Or, you know, sometimes I actually uh, rather radically turn my wireless connection off just so that I won't, uh, so that I sort of won't interrupt my little bio bits with um, with these external sorts of. Um, prompts. Uh, so I think we can do quite a lot of what I think some philosophers have called managerial self-control, which is sort of like just recognizing that, um, that we have certain tendencies and structuring our environment in ways that will help us not to, um, not to manifest those tendencies as much as we might otherwise. So the technological equivalent of tying yourself to the mast, basically. Well, the, um, Back to metaphysics, uh, briefly, S uh, many uh, Eastern contemplative disciplines so make somewhat of a, a, a similar or parallel claim that, the, that if you observe your flow of thoughts, you really don't have control of them. And some kinds of meditation, like mindfulness meditation, have to do with uh, sort of like strengthening um, neural networks by observing what's going through your mind. And so maybe just simply uh, becoming mindful of the contrast between the distractions or seductions of going from link to link on the web and, and whatever the context is. I mean, maybe you're just supposed to explore and learn and your context is to is to go from link to link, and maybe your context is I've got a, a paper due at uh, at four o'clock today, and at some point I need to to focus. The web doesn't really teach you that. The technology itself does not instruct that internal kind of discipline. Yeah, that seems dead right. You know, um, although the more we w would understand, I suppose about about how people are, are, are making use or failing to make use of these opportunities that the kind of scaffolding provides, the more the scaffolding itself might, I think, be able to offer, to offer options. So, you know, at the moment, it's, it's rather brutal. I, have to, I had to turn off my wireless network or something like that. And you can imagine systems, I think, that are a lot more sophisticated than that, that will, you know, um, you, you could pick sort of a bit like picking different sorts of mode in a, a sports car, whether you pick the sort of sports driving mode or one of the other modes, maybe there'll be sort of three or four modes and you can pick ones according to whether you think you're going to need to go down a, a concentrated sort of tunnel of, of fairly focused exploration or whether you want something a bit broader or whether you want to be in effect um, insulated from a lot of information that would otherwise be very accessible to you. And I think we do that already with our own sort of 
biological thinking. I think a lot of, as you uh, as you point out there, and even outside of sort of Buddhist traditions, you know, I think a lot of um, just a lot of what happens when people train themselves to to be good at whatever it is they do is learning to manage their own biological mental resources in, in just this sort of way. So I think it will come rather naturally to us um, to, to do this externally too. So you, I think a good example of that is, is training in mathematics and that you, you, you talk about the necessity of having this kind of ex external uh, mm -hmm. extension of, of the short-term memory by just e even just doing long division, writing it down with a a pencil and paper, but of course, through extensive training, you can do more of that. Um, I guess the com computer uh, programmers would say that you compile it, that more of it, um, you, you train your, your internal apparatus to be able to, to, to do that more swiftly, and you still use the external scaffolding, but you've become more um, adept uh, at, at using it, and I, I wonder whether um, that uh, that's something that uh, I, I don't think that we've really talked about people becoming adept at using the web uh, in that sense. You mean as a society, or, or you and me you, uh, as a, as a I mean, society? So there's a there's a connection, isn't there? The more people who become adept, the yeah. more uh, what Doug Engelbart called the collective IQ. Uh, can yeah. increase uh, so that there's there's kind of an internal component. If I become adept, I I have a competitive advantage. But perhaps there's a commons or a, an external aggregation of a number of adept people. I mean, I think that isn't that that's one of the reasons for for public education is to uh, to make sure that that a complex society is is well run. Yeah, I think that's right. Learning to work together as teams in a way using these sorts of resources is, is, a, is a whole other issue. And so is the kind of, I think there's a sort of version of the, uh, of the kind of swarming issues that you yourself have addressed in, in other books. Um, so, you know, having lots and lots of people more or less intelligently using web-based resources is itself a massive resource. And all the trails that are laid down by those patterns of use uh, they allow us, I think, to just press more, more useful kinds of um, information out of our own activity. So that's something that I think we're going to see a lot of, is kind of the, the role of this technology in allowing us as humans to kind of lay down cognitive trails that then make it much easier for us to find our way through the sort of the, the jungle of information that's out there in ways that uh, are actually uh, making sense. There's, I guess, a there's a bit of a downside to that, a bit like the general collaborative filtering downside, where more and more people will end up going down the same kind of trail. And that's, that in itself is something that we might need technology to work against a bit now and again. So I guess an obvious sort of trivial example, well, I don't mean to, um, trivial, not in a bad sense, but an obvious example is they stumbled upon that, um, that web resource, uh, the, the site that just sort of lets you kind of move from one place to another in a in a fairly slightly systematic but not sort of constrained in quite the ordinary content kind of ways. You, have you used stumbled upon? It's, um, it's a nice... No, I know. Okay, you, you, you might want to check. It's, it's a nice thing because I think it's sort of... Um, it, it's basically a sort of an, an attempt to use the technology to enforce some of the kind of serendipity that you might have got if you were walking around a high street or bookshops or that sort of stuff. So it's kind of like... Um, Yes, it's sort of like, kind of like trying to be spontaneous, <laughs> you know, it's got some of the same inbuilt paradoxes, but, it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's a nice idea, and I think that, you know, when we spot something that the technology might be doing to us, like pushing us down a, a groove and pulling too many people into the same groove, you can just add various kinds of noise to the system to bounce um, a few people out of those grooves now and again, so that the system as a whole gets to explore a, a wider landscape. So you've, uh, you've raised uh, uh, attention to, the, uh, to the, the fact that there are a lot of assumptions that people make about what human nature is when we have these discussions about how is our, our use of tools changing us. And uh, I think it's, it's useful to, 
to re- revisit that notion of of human nature what is what is your your case for what human nature is wow um yeah i mean in a way i'm sort of i'm either a skeptic about human nature or a sort of higher order theorist about it so i think maybe if we have some kind of nature it's the the, the sort of tendency to keep rebuilding and reconstructing ourselves as as kind of cognitive and physical agents for that matter um, somewhere along the way human beings seem to be able to make objects out of their own capacities so you know um, our bodies became objects that we could think about rather than simply acting through and I think our minds became objects that we could think about rather than simply um, thinking In through um, when that sort of thing happens, then, of course, you can begin, as I think Jerry Fodor said, with malice of forethought to design environments in which, um, in which uh, you'll get sort of greater effects from the same old biological kid. Since I'm a defender of the extended mind story, which would identify the, the mental agent, not just with what the biological bit of the system is doing, but potentially with larger s- sort of structures, um, biotechnological hybrids, um, the upshot of that really is that we get to redesign ourselves. And so, and then it's a sort of redesigned human, um, human cognitive agent that gets to participate in the process of redesign for the next um, generation of redesigned human cognitive agents. So, I think that um, the sort of picture we sometimes get from evolutionary psychology where we're sort of ancestral intelligences kind of battling somehow to deal with these sort of strange environments in which modern humans find themselves, it's kind of deeply misleading um, because we are as much a, we're as much a, a part of that new environment as, as it's a, a simple environment for, for an old mind. Well, I, you know, I think a good contemporary example is the way learning to read changes the mind. Um, you've you've cited William Dehane, whose who's recent recent books talk about kind of the, the neuroscience of of reading and how different functional areas of the brain that may be evolved for very different uh, reasons uh, way way back in earlier in human history. Um, are not they're not naturally or biologically coordinated, but by forcing that learning, the kind of the, the cultural campo- component of this scaffolding, people coordinate the part of their brain that that extracts meaning from abstractions, and the part that that arranges things in linear sequences, and the part that recognizes visual uh, patterns in a unique way that ends up literally changing their brain. And that, you know, I think this is a good existence proof of a technology like, like the alphabet and accelerated by print and scaffolded by this, what you need to teach a large number of people to read has literally changed how humans' brains, or at least the educated human brains, literate human brains, function. One, one question that arises from that is that uh, we, we're kind of at the end of this 500-year period in which uh, literacy was the, mm-hmm. maybe the major uh, way of extending the mind. And there are different languages and different alphabets, but that process is pretty much the same. Now we've got the web with mm-hmm. so many different ways of extending the mind that there's no longer kind of a unitary extension. Do you, What do you think? think of this kind of multiplicity and mm-hmm. some might call it fragmentation yeah yeah I think um, I think that's an interesting observation that it, it, it there does seem to be a kind of wider spread of things being made available in that sort of way um, a lot of them do have something in common I think which is that um, that as it were there's more sort of bodily coordination involved than there used to be and so you know you're fiddling around with your mouse and your keyboard and I think in future the the, the, the kind of interface with the body will become even more subtle than that um, and so the, I think that commonality is quite important um, and I think that commonality will help to build more bridges between the kind of abstraction generating parts of the brain and the more sort of, um, I don't know, sort of 
down and dirty sort of physical interaction part. And I, that, but that's probably going to be a very good thing. It's, it's something that you, we've clearly, you know, some evidence of it already in, um, in, in gamers. But uh, I think we'll see a lot more evidence of that. And those changes, I think, could be, could be functional and kind of interesting. So, of course, it's true that whatever you do is going to change the brain in some way. I think it's the point that Stephen Pinker made in, um, in uh, a response to, is the internet making us dumb? But, you know, of course, it's true. Even playing badminton is going to change your brain in some way. But some changes are more interesting than others, and some probably amount to changing you as a kind of cognitive functional architecture. Um, so, so, yeah, um, the, the other thing, I suppose, the other downside of what, what, what you mentioned, sort of spread of, of stuff here, is that when it was just a few things, then there was a sort of focused social um, attempt to find the sort of meta scaffoldings that enabled us to use those few things better. So in the case of literacy and, you know, print and books and so on, um, we, we had quite a lot of time to get to grips with that and sort of slowly develop institutions and scaffoldings things seem to be moving a bit a bit quicker than that and uh, and that means that we have more of a scrabble to keep up but at the same time the technologies themselves are, are, are I think helping us to scrabble quicker uh, so the only worry you might have there is do we really want to be on a, a wheel that's going faster and faster and faster all the time Yeah, I, yeah um, I, di I just don't know. I mean, I'm an optimist about it. I think that it's all going to turn out, turn out well, more or less. Um, it could be that there are some sort of affective limits here. So, you know, the, when I think about extending the mind through um, well-fitted dovetail technologies, then the idea is sort of that, you know, the balance between the various bio and non-bio bits of the machinery can be as delicate as it is between the various biological bits. But when you think about affect and emotion, it becomes a little bit harder to see quite what's going on there. It's as if sort of spreading the cognitive load is something we can rather easily get, get to grips with. Spreading the affective load, we do a bit of it, you know, we create music that kind of feeds back and alters affect and you can organize your room and, and, and things in a way that generates the right sort of affective atmosphere for, um, for certain kinds of work. But I don't think that we have technologies of affect manipulation and affect flow manipulation that are, are really quite up there yet with the others. Maybe they could be more sort of um, pharmacological technologies, I don't know. Okay, thank you.